All right, welcome back to The Big Give. We probably don't need to introduce our next guest, but we will. Um, Dr. Thieber, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, no, I'm happy to, happy to be here. Well, I'll tell you, one of the first names I heard when they started training me was, have you met Ron Thiebert? Have you met Ron Thiebert? So I feel like we're, we have a bit of a VIP with us today. So um, I wanted to tell parents because immediately people are going to say, oh, we have him. I have a question. Feel free to put questions in the, um, on Facebook. We may not get to them all. I do encourage you if you're putting a question to realize too that there's a lot that, as you all know, that goes up behind with your chart for your child. So it may be tough for him to answer things if it's very specific about a seizure medication mixed with other things, but feel free to generally ask some questions and then Neka, you can help us with those. So um, Dr. Thieber, do you want to take two seconds and introduce yourself about and why do 15Q? Why is this part of your life? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, I am a, a pediatric epileptologist at Mass General in Boston. Um, that's why I wore the shirt so that people would know. Right <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, um, I finished my uh, epilepsy fellowship in 2008. And um, during the, that time I had done a, uh, um, a research project for Angelman syndrome. So when I finished, we started an Angelman clinic because there, there weren't any at the time. Um, there were no, actually no chromosome 15 type clinics. And then um, a couple of years later, uh, or within the next couple of years, you know, because it's the same set of genes that researchers that worked on Angelman and Duke 15 Q were at uh, all the meetings and some of the Duke 15, um, uh, research uh, uh, people said, oh, why don't you have a Duke 15 clinic? And I was like, I don't know. It's, I don't know if I'm ready for two clinics. And then, um, and then I got a call from, uh, from Katie, who was the uh, executive director at the time saying, oh, I heard you're starting a Duke 15 clinic. <laughs> so, That's how we so roped it in. <laughs> in 2010. And, um, and, uh, and then it's just, uh, I had no idea how big it would get, but it's just kind of taken off since then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that our families are incredibly grateful that you have taken this as a passion of yours. Um, one concern, and Neka, you feel free to interrupt me as well and ask any questions. One thing we often hear is, I can't get there to see him. I can't get there to see him. I Maybe they can't afford to fly to Boston. How can, what kind of relationship could you have with their neurologist um, if they're really, if people are really worried about getting to you because you are one of our ex biggest experts? Yeah, so, um, so the nice thing was we were the only clinic for two years and then, um, at one of the uh, scientific meetings, it was actually in Boston, we presented kind of like the, the clinic data we had kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of went through the old charts and, and kind of what we had learned in two years. And then that kind of sparked interest in other clinics. And so I think now there's something like 17, 18, there's like a huge, yeah. like just in 12 years, there's a, so just the fact that it's not just one clinic, like way up in the Northeast, there's, you know, 18 around the country. And we have, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, clinic meetings and, um, you know, we, we talk to each other in between, you know, by email or whatever. So we're kind of always in contact as, as a group. So, um, you know, it's gone from just kind of, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, you have to go to Boston or else, you know, there's, there's nowhere else to go to like having 18 places yeah. to go. And, and if it's, um, if it's too hard to get to any clinic, um, you know, uh, there, you know, we can consult with, you know, the local, you know, your, your local doctors, um, you know, if it's uh, an epilepsy question, it, it could be me or, or one of the other epilepsy doctors, if it was more of a, like an autism behavioral question, you know, someone like um, Shafali Jesti would be super helpful. So, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, and there's, there's psychiatrists for, you know, the, um, you know, the older kids that have more psychiatric issues. So there's uh, people that are really um, you know, kind of experts in whatever kind of field uh, that, that's needed and, and they, they're available for consultation. Um, so just kind of, you know, like, you know, doctor to doctor, you know, we are, we're able to um, kind of help out that way, which is, you know, could sometimes be just as helpful. I love that. And, and that's such a good reminder if people are, if you're newly diagnosed or you've, you've had known your child's had Duke for a long time, we as the Alliance, one of the things we do as part of our ladder learning network, the big umbrella is help set up those physician to physician consults. So um, that's something that Dr. Thiebert may be on, or we may bring in Jesty, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jesty. So I want people to not, not feel, I want them to feel empowered that they have the resources. Um, I want to jump right over to epilepsy because most people are going to be like, okay, enough about that. Let's, let's ask him some epilepsy questions. A lot of times our community is terrified of SUDEP. I mean, we hear this all often and there's such a, a fear of this. If your child doesn't have epilepsy or don't, hasn't shown any signs of seizures, 
should they go ahead and partner with a neurologist? Like, do they get ahead of it? Talk a little bit about your advice with that. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I am. Um, uh, it's, it's always kind of a tricky question, like what to do if it's not there. Do you have like a rescue medicine? Um, and, um, you know, we kind of in general, we, we recommend at least a, a screening EEG, um, at least kind of a, a, like a, an in the clinic, you know, kind of an in the lab EEG, but ideally even a 24 hour just to kind of get a good baseline. And it's always nice to have that baseline because if something changes in the future, you can look back and compare it to when you know there was nothing clearly going on clinically. So um, so even if there's no seizures, I think it's a good idea to see a neurologist and get that baseline test. Um, and with seizures, it, it's somewhere in the, for people with uh, isodicentric 15, it's about 50 to 60% have seizures. So for those um, families where their children do have seizures, you know, it's, you know, you're not alone. It's very common. There's, um, there's lots of families going through the same thing. And for those families whose children haven't had seizures, um, you still have that, you know, close to 50% chance that, that you may not. So, um, so in, in either kind of a, on either side, there's, you know, that optimism. Um, and, and with, uh, with those that do have seizures, they can, they can actually be pretty mild and easy to treat. They can be impossible to treat. Um, there's, there's a, you know, quite the spectrum, but, um, and by impossible, I mean, just difficult. Like, you know, there, there's, there's always, there's always something out there, but, um, but even if seizures do start, um, they're not, they're not, it's not always that really, like really difficult to treat. Um, some are, are kind of controlled more easily. So even if you do have seizures, there's still that, that kind of spectrum of severity. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned the rescue uh, medication. Is that something that they, some, a parent should advocate and push for to have a rescue medication on hand in case their child does have a seizure and it's 3 a.m.? Yeah. For, um, for uh, for families that their children haven't had seizures yet, we usually don't because that first seizure, if it's if it's a small seizure, you don't really need it. But if it's a big seizure, you're going to call nine one one anyway. Um, and then for for people that have had seizures, we definitely recommend having a rescue medication. Yeah, yeah. But but it's tough. Like for for those that their children haven't had seizures yet, um, I, that's you know that kind of wondering when it's going to come. I, you know, is is super difficult, but. Um, you know, if you kind of think about the numbers, there's, there, you know, there's a 50, 50 chance that it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, so we always say kind of, you know, keep an eye out and watch for them, but you know, it's, it's not inevitable. Like some, you know, a lot of people just don't ever have them. So, um, you know, kind of keep in mind that that's, uh, that's an option. Yeah. My yeah. daughter yelling in the background. I love, hey, we're all, we've got dogs barking and everything else. So don't worry. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Ryland to come busting in any second. And join <laughs> us, so. um, you, you hit the nail on the head that like we're always just waiting for the seizure shoe to drop, so to speak. Is there like an age benchmark? Like I feel like there's infantile spasms. We we see kids getting them around six, maybe around puberty, and then some into adulthood. Is there kind of benchmarks like if you pass this age, you might be past it? Yeah. Um. There's not a definite one, but in general. You know, if you get past the first year, then then you've missed the infantile spasms, which is the big thing. That's you know that's that's always, uh, you know, when you have infantile spasms, the odds of having more difficult to treat seizures is is much higher. Um, so if you get past that first year without those, that's a really good start. And then what we see is for the kind of the more lennox gastro type syndromes, um, which is like the you know the the head drops, the stiffening, the just the very frequent seizure types, um, and uh, with you know kind of difficult to treat with medicine. Um, for just in general, Lennox Hesto is most common between like age three and five, just for epilepsy in general, but maybe like two and five. But what we've seen in children with um, Du15Q is that it's more like, like you said, like six, seven, eight, even nine. So it can it can start a little bit later. Um, but once you get past that and towards the beginning of puberty, um, then that becomes much less likely too. So kind of the the most difficult type seizure syndrome start with the spasms. The second most difficult, you avoid the spasms, but then get those Lennox Gasto type seizures, um, kind of more towards middle school. And then, um, and if you get past that into puberty, uh, you know, we, we have had people that have developed focal seizures. Um, but once you get kind of into puberty and you haven't had any, there's still that chance of, you know, focal seizures, which are much easier to treat. But, um, you know, the odds of that more difficult epilepsies are usually behind you. Um, and then once you get towards, uh, you know, 18 or 20, it, it, it'd be unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely to have seizures at all. But as you get older, the odds just get less and less of seizures at all, but also the more difficult types. 
Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that, and it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a plus or minus, but the, um, uh, you know, we look at developmental progress, kids that are verbal, um, you know, they're talking and that kind of hit their milestones quicker. They're less likely to have seizures than ones that are um, kind of more delayed nonverbal. So there's also that predictor. Um, does it mean that if you're nonverbal and your, your motor skills are more delayed that you will have seizures, but there's a little higher chance, whereas those who were, you know, walking by, you know, two or three and, and, um, and, uh, and have words or sentences, um, their, their odds are, are less likely for the, for the more difficult seizures. Yeah. I do, I, we often hear when kids start having seizures, they regress. You know, we do have kids who, you know, there's always the, the rule of thumb. And then I feel like our deep yeah. two kids decide, no, we're not going to follow that. We'll do what we want. Um, but there have been some kids who are verbal and they have these skills and they start having seizures and they lose the skills. And there's always a, a you know, a conversation. Is it from the seizures that they're losing the skills or is it from the medication that they're losing the skills or is it a combination? Yeah, it's, um, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's more the seizures, but it's always in all of the above. Um, uh, but, but it's more so, you know, when you have a normal EEG and then it kind of shifts to, um, you know, just kind of abnormal with some spikes to even further to the kind of the Lennox Gesto EEG where it's very abnormal in sleep. Um, uh, you know, that's the main cause of the regressions. Um, and, uh, but what's, you know, on the, on the positive side, if you can control the seizures, improve the EEG, the skills come back. So, um, I mean, it's easier to say that than to, to actually control the seizures sometimes, but, um, but, you know, the, those regressions that we see with, uh, with the beginning of seizures, uh, that is, you know, that, that, the, the, the loss of those skills can reverse and those skills can come back with, with good control. So that's, that's the, again, there's, you know, there's always, for every bad thing, there's always room for some optimism. And if we can get those under control, the, um, you know, we see the skills kind of reemerge, which is great. Yeah. yeah. And then I wanted to add yeah. that the definition of seizure control isn't always zero seizures, right? It right. should be having some, but it's, it's managed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you really kind of nailed it with the seizures versus medicines. Um, there's, you know, with some, People, some kids, we, you know, we think we could maybe get to zero seizures if they were on seven medicines, but then they sleep all day, and so so you, you kind of get to that. Um, you know, if you if you're not able to just kind of get use a couple of medicines, get it like you know down to zero seizures, the the um, kind of the question becomes at what point, like if you're on three or four medicines, having just a few seizures here and there, or is it worth allowing those seizures to be there, not to add another potentially sedating medicine, and so it, it you know kind of have to balance that. Um, you know, quality of life versus, you know, the total control because the, you know, the medicines do have some effect on development. And when, when you start seizure medicine, usually you see development improve because you're, you know, knocking down the seizures, but at some point, you know, once you, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, get some, some control, um, if you add more medicines, more medicines, and they can start to have a negative impact because they're just, it gets too sedating. So it's always that kind of balance. You know, you always want to, we always say the goal is zero seizures, zero side effects, but um, for some kids, you know, maybe not zero seizures, but, um, you know, but not being sedated from the medicine is, you know, kind of the, that kind of where, where we want people to be. That's such a good point, because I think a lot of, I mean, all of our goals would be zero seizures, um, but what a good point that it may, may not mean that for every child. One of the things I think I've, the theme I've heard the most with families I've spoken with is that mm -hmm. our our kids are just, they're, every one of them are truly unique. Like, it's not going to be that, you know, Nako's child is not going to look like someone else's, and um, getting them to that point is, it can be a challenging. Yeah. Um, we're checking to the reason you guys may see us looking back and forth. We're looking for questions. Um, yeah. And that's one of the challenging things with medicines too, like for some other genetic syndromes, um, like Angelman for one, there, there's a few medicines that tend to work really well. And so, you know, if they have you know, Angelman that these medicines can help, or if, you know, tuber sclerosis, like, you know, this medicine, but, um, but for, for 215, it, it, you know, we've had the, you know, the, the kids that we've seen that have responded well, finally to a medicine after not doing well with several medicines, it's been all, it's been different ones. It's been, been bad. Yeah. It's been by compa. It's been a dialect. So it's, um, you know, there's, there's not like a recipe book where it's like, oh yeah, if you have 215Q, it's this medicine. It's unfortunately there's some trial and error, but, um, uh, you know, we just, you know, the, there's, there's, 
then there's so many more medicines out there than there were there even 10 years ago. So, um, you know, there's always more options. There's the surgical options are getting better. Um, instead, you know, typically surgery, you like, like to cut out the piece that's seizing, but in do 15 Q, it's the whole brain. So we can't get the whole brain out. So, but there's, there's, um, there's stimulators. So a lot of kids have the VNS, but now there's more kind of fancier uh, stimulators that go inside the, inside the skull, which I know sounds scary, but it's, it's really, it's really safe procedures, but, um, and, and diet, uh, diet therapy, we've had a couple of kids do really well on ketogenic diet. So there's, there's lots of treatments out there. If the first few meds haven't worked, um, you know, there's, there's, there's always, there's always more. So, um, even though it can get discouraging to, to fail this one, fail this one, there's, there's always more options. Yeah. Yeah. That's encouraging. That's encouraging that sometimes it's just that mix of medications and diet or medications and BNS or um, that it, it certainly sounds trial and error at some times with what's going to work. Um, I'm curious, are there other questions that you commonly get, Dr. Thiebert, that from parents when they're, their child's having seizures that maybe we haven't thought to ask? Like um, something commonly that's, and I'm sure SUDEP comes up, the concern of SUDEP. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything along those lines or something else that is seizure related that you hear from parents that, that would be good for our families to know? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think you hit most of them that, you know, there's always that, you know, should we see a neurologist? Should we have rescue medicine? Like, what can we do to prevent the seizures? And unfortunately, if, if someone's wired to have them, they're just going to happen. And the key mm. is recognizing them early. So um, that's another good reason to see a neurologist. You can kind of go through what seizures might look like, um, like you know, because you know, when someone has what we call a tonic-clonic seizure, those are easy to spot, you know, eyes roll back, everything shakes. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty easy to, to recognize. But a lot of times the initial seizures are subtle, They're either little head drops or stiffening events or even staring spells. And sometimes, and, you know, they just may not look worrisome at all. So that's, um, so that's another good reason to see a neurologist really just to kind of, you know, you know, get that screening EEG, but also say, okay, like, you know, have you seen any of this or this or this? Um, and, uh, and just kind of know to look for it ahead of time because the earlier you can say this looks like it might be seizure, get in touch with your neurologist. Um, the sooner you start medicines, um, you can hopefully kind of get control of it before it really kind of kind of gets out of control. But, um, but as far as prevent, yeah, there's nothing we do to prevent them. Um, yeah. But we can hopefully treat them early and then um, and aggressively and try to, try to get a hold of them before they get too bad. Yeah, yeah. I think your point about some of the harder to spot seizures are probably like the first line of defense I feel like parents should do to educate themselves on what they look like. Because I, I think a lot of times with our kids when they have um, additional sensory needs, some of the staring spells or the stiffening yeah. or, you know, you, you're not sure if that's sensory, if they're just kind of playing around or if it's a seizure. So I, I think, um, you know, the first thing parents should do if they're worried about their child having seizures and having that is just educate them on the different types of seizures yep. and what they could look like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the best thing you can do be before seizures start. And again, hopefully they never do, but um, but just knowing what they look like and, and getting them treated quickly is the best thing you can do. Now, Dr. Thieber, once you do that initial EEG, if you're not having any seizures, should you do that every year, do the 24-hour EEG or how mm -hmm. often? Yeah, we usually don't. Um, I know different people have different thoughts, but you know, you kind of see how how, um, how a kid is doing, and, and you get the EEG, and if it looks good, um, if they keep kind of pushing forward with development and making progress, making progress, then the odds are they're not having seizures. Um, so the usually once we get that initial EEG, if it looks good, the um, we say you know let's get another one if you think you're seeing seizures or if there's some sort of kind of leveling out or regression with development because the seizures could be very subtle. Um, or sometimes, you know, the EG will change before the seizures begin. And so you might have a, you know, a lot of spikes in sleep and you're not really seeing seizures, but you're seeing that development kind of, you know, kind of plateau school saying, yeah, they're not quite as good as this or that as they were. And that's when you'd want to get an EEG. Um, and again, like, you know, if, if we, if you see that kind of developmental kind of uh, plateauing and there's, there's no clear seizures, sometimes we get the EEG, we see the, um, the spikes at night, and then we can start treating even before the clinical seizures were, were to start. Wow, yeah, yeah. So it's also yeah. something to watch for. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great advice. We had a question from someone um, asking about the bed alarms, bed monitors. Is there, do you recommend those when you're trying to, to watch for seizures? And if so, is there one you really like? It's a good question. It's, there's, there's uh, amongst um, epilepsy folks, there's no really good consensus on 
on those. And the, the tricky thing um, for Duke 15, so if you have a, like a, a, what I call a convulsive seizure, you know, there's actually shaking, like that'll set the alarms off. Um, but if you're just having some subtle stiffening, uh, you know, it, it might not trigger the alarm. And then the other part is you have some kids, they're just bad sleepers and they're just tossing and turning all night. So the alarm might go off over and over. So, um, you know, depending, you know, for, for um, you know, for, for kids that are pretty well controlled, but might have the occasional like tonic-clonic seizure, they're, they're, they're definitely helpful. For, um, for kids that are having more frequent subtle seizures, um, they're not quite as helpful. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so we don't, we don't, uh, we never say don't get one, but um, it's, you know, there's, there's not great evidence that it's going to be helpful. So for, for each family, it's up to, you know, if they feel more comfortable with one, then it's, it's worth doing if it's going to, if it's going to yeah. help. But it's, um, you know, for, for, and for some people, it really does help. And for others, it just wakes them up more for non seizures. And then it, becomes difficult but um yeah. but yeah it's you know it's definitely something worth exploring there's just not really good evidence uh, yet as to how helpful they are okay okay and we had another parent ask is there anything we can do to normalize sleep patterns um uh yes so there's um you know we would start with um like we call it like sleep training or uh sleep hygiene just getting into the routine and there's you know that that would be a whole whole hour in itself but but um uh, you know, you can always talk to, um, you know, uh, your doctors or even therapists and, um, and, uh, like that's the first thing is to get like a good, a bedtime routine, a structure. Um, and that, that often helps, um, for some kids though, it, the bad sleep is just kind of wired into the chromosome and no matter what you do, it, it's not helpful. Um, so in those cases, when you really tried all the behavioral techniques and nothing's really working, there's, there's, um, there's several safe and easy medications for sleep that really help. Cause one of the, probably the biggest trigger outside of, um, you know, being sick with a fever, the, the biggest trigger for seizures is, um, is poor sleep. And when I say trigger, the, the trigger for people that already have epilepsy like that can worsen their seizures. If you're not really, if you're not, if you don't have epilepsy and you're not, turns out you're not going to be wired to, the poor sleep won't cause seizures. Um, but for someone that has that, um, uh, is kind of, you know, that, that you know, the brain has seizures, um, poor sleep will really worsen the seizures. So one of the best things you can, so sometimes the best seizure medicines are sleep medicines or GI medicines. Um, you know, when kids get really bad reflux or constipation, that'll worsen the seizures as well. So whenever anyone, you know, calls, you know, any of our families call and they say, you know, we're having more seizures, we always ask, you know, are they sleeping? Are you pooping? Because um, those things can really, um, can really worsen seizures. And just by correcting those uh, aspects, the, the seizures can get better without, um, without additional seizure meds. Yeah, thank you. And I know we're almost out of time, but of course, people, I know, as I imagined, they were going to have lots of great questions for you. Um, do you have any advice for kids who have prolonged tonic seizures and not breathing? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, the, so, um, so with seizures, uh, it's one of the, you know, the scariest thing I think for people is when they look like they're not breathing or they're breathing very shallow, they get um, kind of blueness around the lips. The, um, the, so the brain is, the brain is very, very smart and it knows um, if you're not, you know, if you're not breathing deeply and you're taking these shallow breaths, not getting enough oxygen in, um, it, it points the oxygen towards the brain and the heart so that they're, that they're going to be okay and away from the skin because the skin can be okay without oxygen for a while. So kids can look bluish, but they're, you know, the, the vital organs are getting the oxygen they need. Um, so even if a tonic seizure goes 20, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, um, you know, the brain and the heart are still getting, still getting a good amount of oxygen. So they, they look a lot scarier than they are. Um, but even knowing that they're still going to look terrifying. That's, that's the hard part. But, okay. but when you see blue around the mouth, um, it, it tells you that the skin isn't getting the oxygen that uh, it usually does. Um, but and typically the brain and the heart are. Is there anything a parent should do? Like if they're, if that's happening repeatedly, I mean, obviously talking to their doctor, of course, yeah. Um, is there anything, any advice if you were to advise their physician? Um, and that may be too loose because you've got so much other details that you would have to yeah. have. Um, does that mean their medication's not working? They need to try something new? Yeah, if it if it happens, if it's happening, if it's happening very frequently, then that that might, you know, that would probably require a trip to the ER. Because if uh, that's the other thing when when seizures kind of ramp up out of nowhere sometimes, it's just that the epilepsy is worsening and that's just how it is. But often there's something going on and um 
uh, you know, the brain can sense an illness, you know, 24 hours or more before the kids look sick. So sometimes, you, you know, if you see seizures for really ramp up over 24 hours, sometimes it's um, probably sometimes most of the time it's good to either, you know, if you can get an urgent visit with your doctor or, you know, have to go to like an urgent care in ER just because there could be a pneumonia and ear infection that's not showing signs yet, but is there and, and the brain, the brain knows it's there. Yeah. So fascinating. So fascinating. The very last thing I want to cover in the 30 seconds we have left right now <laughs> um, is we are really trying to encourage our families to sign up for our medical database. Can you just give like a quick pitch on why is that important in the work you're doing and for our future therapies from your point of view? Yeah, sure. So for um, like when we started our clinic and we were kind of the only ones for a while, we, um, you know, we collected data from the clinics, uh, like from the, uh, you know, from the charts. And we've published a few papers, one on seizures, one on GI issues, um, uh, EEG, um, EEG and MRI uh, findings. And those are all good, but that was, you know, our whatever 40, 50 patients. Now we've seen like 150, but in the clinic network as a whole, there's, I don't know how many, but there's, you know, there's hundreds and there's hundreds yeah. and hundreds. So the, the more, the more data we have that we can look at, um, the more, yeah, you know, it's just better to understand the um, the uh, the syndrome itself, and you know, kind of what what medical issues could pop up. Are there things that we haven't seen yet? But in a bigger sample, there's you know more stuff pops up, and we say, okay, well now we do have seen like ten people with this. It's something we should watch for, and um, and also that's that's kind of the main part. But it also um, kind of gives you things to look at for you know when gene therapy is available. Um, kind of markers uh, to to kind of show how well things are being treated. So whenever you have a, a drug or therapy trial, um, you know you always have to prove to the FDA that it's doing something. So you need yeah. to know what what is not going properly um, in kids that have this disorder, and and like what can be fixed by whatever treatment it is. And then um, so it's it's super helpful for um, for upcoming uh, uh, you know gene therapy type treatments as well. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron, for joining oh, us today. Our families so love having you. Um, yep. And I just want to remind everyone that we are, our goal is to raise $50,000 to support our ladder learning network, which includes the clinics that Dr. Ron runs um, and the data that he's using to, to see where our kids are at. So if you um, are able to donate, please do so. Our Education Food Alliance Board is going to match your donation up to $50,000. So we could have $100,000 to support our ladder learning network and clinic. So thank you so much, Dr. Ron. You thank are you. a pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. Thank it's great you to so see much. you guys. Happy Saturday. Yeah, thank you too. You thank Thanks. you.